Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for leading us in song. Thank you, Don, for leading us in our Advent meditation this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you today, I'd invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 57 through 80. Luke, chapter 1, verses 57 through 80. We've been in uh, Luke, chapter 1, since the beginning of uh, Advent several weeks ago, and so we are continuing that series as we see the events that God set forth in motion to lead up to the birth of of Jesus Christ. And so uh, we'll continue that series today, and I'd invite you to follow us, follow along with us in your own Bible. Uh, If you would, please stand, wherever you might be, stand for the reading of God's Word. We want to honor that this morning. So if you would, please read with me Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 58, 57 through 80. Uh, Please listen, for this is God's Word to us. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son, and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God, and fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies, and that from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us, that we might serve him without fear. Sorry, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High to give knowledge of salvation, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God whereby the sun shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you speak to us by your word? We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Well, indeed, we've talked about Advent being a season of waiting for the Lord's return, and as we reflect on Israel's waiting for the Lord's Messiah to arrive, uh, one of my favorite metaphors for the season of Advent is that of a pregnant woman waiting to give birth to a child. Now, we know that whenever Christ returns, it will be at a time of His choosing that we cannot tell, we can't have a hand in that moment, we can't exactly predict it. But before birth, we're told there are labor pains. And these painful moments, they give us a signal that something is about to happen. We read about this in Romans chapter 8, verses 22 to 23, where Paul writes, For we know that the whole creation, not just you and me, but all of creation, has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly await for adoption as sons for the redemption of our bodies. Thus, as we wait for Christ's return, as we long for that moment, it's like waiting for a pregnant woman to give birth to a baby. And remember, through Advent, we've kind of noticed some similar characteristics in the stories that we've read. First, it started with Mary kind of in the midst of wedding planning, hearing the news from Gabriel that she would be giving birth to the Messiah. And then after Mary, Elizabeth uh, and Mary have a baby shower together where they celebrate uh, 
uh, the coming of each one's child and how the baby John in the womb praises the name of Jesus by leaping in the womb. And then today we've gone from the wedding planning to a baby shower. Now we're going to the birth of a baby. And it's maybe not the baby that we expected, right? Unto us a child is born, but it's not the Messiah Jesus. It's actually his relative John. But it still is something that has real significance. But John's significance is to prepare us for the main event. It's kind of like an internship, right? If you work an internship as you're training in your career, you're working a very real job, getting hopefully paid something real, but it's preparing you to do something even greater. And the same way, John's birth is almost like a trial run. We're here seeing the birth of this miraculously conceived child, but even in his birth, his role is to prepare the way, to be a forerunner of the person of Jesus. And so as we look at this passage today in Luke 1, here's what we're going to see, is that Jesus' birth confirms the promises of salvation for God's people, and his anointing prepares us for the even greater salvation that is to come through Jesus Christ. Let me say that one more time. John's birth confirms the promises of salvation for God's people, And his anointing prepares us for the even greater salvation that is to come through Jesus Christ. Well, the first way that our passage does this today is that John's birth reminds us of a God's once and future grace. John's birth reminds us of a once and future grace. In verse 57, we're told that it's the time for Elizabeth to have her child. And once she gives birth to a son, the relatives and friends that she has, they hear about God's great mercy upon Elizabeth, right? And they rejoice with her, right? And we already have God's mercy in view at this moment, right? They acknowledge that all of life is a gift from God. And as Elizabeth said in Luke 1 25, surely the Lord has taken away my reproach among the people, right? The embarrassment, the shame, the disappointment that Elizabeth experienced as she was childless even unto old age. God had taken that away by giving her this son. Well, now the baby's been born. Well, the next question everyone wants to know, what's his name going to be? Right? And although Zechariah had been told that he would be conceiving a son with Elizabeth, Elizabeth, they didn't have ultrasounds back then. She'd, and he couldn't tell her that it was going to be a baby boy. So they didn't know, they couldn't plan ahead for what the gender was going to be in the naming. So when this baby boy comes out and the family sees it there, They assume, well, Zechariah, who doesn't have any kids, surely he's going to name his first son after himself. But Elizabeth answers and says, no, his name's going to be John. And that perplexes all of them. They're like, but John's not a family name. You have to use a family name, right? Today, few people use family names. Back, Back then, almost everybody had a family name. And so they go to find Zechariah, the father, and they ask him for confirmation And if you remember the last time we left Zechariah, he had just received this miraculous proclamation from the angel Gabriel, but we left him and he was mute, unable to speak, because he hadn't immediately received the word from God that was delivered to Gabriel. He did not believe, he didn't trust that that word would come true. And one of the things that muteness was associated with in ancient times was deafness. If someone couldn't speak, then they assumed, and often it was tied with, well, you couldn't hear, because those who were deaf couldn't speak either. So the people motioned to Zechariah, you know, what is his name? And Zechariah asked for a piece of paper. You know, they didn't have paper and pen everywhere back then. It was actually a pretty expensive process to write. But he asks for a slate, and he writes down, his name is John. And thus his mouth is open. Remember what the name John means in Hebrew. It means the Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious. And so Zechariah regains the ability to speak, but notice that he doesn't regain the ability to speak until, he, he doesn't regain it once the baby's born, but rather it's once he actually says the name that the child was promised to have. He fulfills what God had prepared for him. And I want us to think about Zechariah for just a minute and God's grace in his life. Because we, once Zechariah gets the pronouncement of muteness, he basically disappears from the scene. Everything focuses around Mary and Elizabeth and their conception and the babies that are growing in their wombs. But now Zechariah is suddenly back on the scene. I want us to think, why is that? 
Well, I think we noticed that Zechariah kind of went off the scene because of his lack of faith. He didn't, uh, he was kind of like an NFL roster. He was inactive for a time. And I'm not saying that he didn't have faith that would save him, but I'm saying his, his, uh, his wavering of faith made him less relevant to the story. But once he believed, suddenly he's back in the scene. He's back in center stage talking about how God had fulfilled his promises. Sometimes we wonder why we aren't experiencing more grace in our lives. And God works in mysterious ways. There are so many reasons that different things could be happening. But we must also ask ourselves, are we trusting in God's promises? Are we trusting that what God promised us in his word, that he will bring that to fruition? And I would submit to you and to us that if we trust in the Lord, then God would be more willing to use us in our lives for his purposes. But the second thing I want us to realize about Zechariah, I don't want to be too hard on him. Right? Zechariah is returned back on the scene because God has a purpose for him. Right? God is ready for Zechariah to do something amazing. Oftentimes we want to be in the center stage. Right? We wonder why our gifts and why our abilities are not being used more likely. Why isn't everyone seeing us? And I would really say that 90 to 95% of the time, that that originates not from a desire to please God, but rather from a desire to receive the glory from men. Right? There are seeds of pride that have been plucked into our soul and they're growing out. And we really want the praise of others. That's why we want to be right here so that everyone can see me and everyone can hear what I have to give. But we have to be careful. We must make sure that our concern is for God's glory. And whenever God's ready to use us, then other people may or may not see us. Right? Not everything that God does is out in the open for everyone to see. But God is ready to use Zechariah. And I want you to think about where, what he would have been like. For nine months, this old father-to-be had a pregnant wife and isn't able to speak at all. He can't talk to his relatives. He can't talk to his neighbors. He can't even talk to his wife. So he's been mute for nine months. He can't just simply scribble messages to people. He can't send text messages. And so if you had nine months to not speak and ponder what you would say, what would you say after a nine-month hiatus on speech? Well, Zechariah has the time to meditate on it. And you can imagine he's probably a bit frustrated, a bit desperate, but also he's also feeling with the birth of his son certainly triumphant. And so filled with the Holy Spirit, he sings a song, and it's one of the most theologically rich songs in the entire Bible. And so having meditated and received God's once and future grace, Zechariah then sings a song about God's once and future salvation. God's once and future salvation. Right? He praises God for what God has done in the past, even his ancient past, and he looks forward to what God is going to do through his son to bring about salvation in the world. And there's three aspects of salvation that Zechariah meditates on. So I want us to look at each of those in turn as we work through this song. The first one is redemption. He sings of redemption, which I would say is our experience of salvation. Redemption is our experience of salvation. Look at verse 68. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He's rescued them. He's delivered them. He's bought them out of slavery. And of course, the main image of redemption from the Bible, the pinnacle of Israel's own salvation history, was the exodus out of Egypt. Right? God delivered his people from Pharaoh's hand and from bondage to slavery, and he delivered them to freedom. He arrived. And so Zechariah reflects upon a new form of redemption. Verse 69 says that he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now that might seem like a strange image to us. What does it mean that God's raised up a horn of salvation? Well, he probably has in mind a ram's horn. And this would reflect on the strength of the ram. But this is a common image we see in the Old Testament. It's sometimes used of God. Like in Psalm 18, verse 2. And David prays this prayer. He says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, insert my redeemer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So it speaks of God's salvation for us, but it's also something that God promises to David, 
that there would be a horn raised up in his house. Look at Psalm 89, verse 24. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. And so whenever Zechariah says that God has raised up a horn of salvation, what he's noticing is that God is doing something new. He's going to be active in David's house again to bring a deliverer, to bring a king, to bring a Messiah for the salvation of the people. Well, the prophets had spoke about redemption in very concrete manifestations. Verse 71, look at that. It says that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us. Zechariah is reflecting upon the covenant-making God, how he made covenant relationships with Israel. And in Whenever God makes a covenant with Israel, it's normally always after he has delivered them from something. So you think of a text like 2 Samuel 17, 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, when God makes a covenant with David. He says, Your house and your kingdom shall made be sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And if you think of the life of David, after God had called David, his life was constantly at risk. King Saul was always hunting him. He was assailed by the Philistines. Nevertheless, God protected David. He redeemed him from danger and made a covenant blessing with him. You think of Israel. It was after God had carried them up out of Egypt, after they'd gone through the Red Sea, that God had made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai. So he considers very real acts of salvation for the people. And what God, Zechariah sees what God is doing in the present situation as a continuation of God's covenant promises There is a new redemption at work. There is a new, long-awaited salvation that is coming and that God will bring about through the work of the Messiah, which God will start with the birth of John the Baptist. So my question for you today as we reflect upon our experience of salvation is, how have you experienced redemption today? How have you experienced redemption? Have you, what has God saved you from? Right? Maybe it's from a sin or a addiction or a pattern in your life that was harming you and that was ruining your life. Maybe there was a certain relationship that whenever God saved you, he pulled you away from that relationship and delivered you. Maybe there has been someone pursuing you for your harm. Right? It doesn't always have to be physical harm. Maybe they've tried to slander your reputation. Maybe they've tried to ruin other relationships in your life. How has God intervened to deliver you in those circumstances? Reflect upon the experience of our salvation. And like Zechariah, turn that into praise of God. Well, having praised God for redemption and the experience of salvation, Zechariah then moves to praising God for our sanctification, or I would say the fruit of our salvation, our sanctification, the fruit of our salvation, that God would literally make us holy, that he would set us apart for himself. Having remembered Moses and David, Zechariah also looks back to Abraham, even further back in verses 72 and 73. God gives us salvation in order to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. Right, if you think back to Genesis chapter 12, God is, uh, if you read in the Bible, you know that sin is ruining the world. We've had the fall out of Eden. We've had a a global flood that destroyed all of humanity except for one family. We've had the Tower of Babel come where humans rebelled against God's word once again. And so God calls this man Abraham and he gives him a promise. A promise that would reverse the course of human history. In Genesis chapter 12 verses 2 and 3, God promises Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. A childless man, just like Zechariah was, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is a universal promise made to this family. And so Zechariah reminds us that God called Abraham for a purpose. Yes, God is going to give Abraham salvation, but look at verses 74 and 75. The deliverance that God offers us is so that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. God saves us in order that we might serve him. Our salvation is for service. God has called us. If you've believed in Jesus Christ, if you're serving him today, then God has called you to be holy and righteous before him. 
Right? I think oftentimes we treat salvation as if, well, I've got my fire insurance, right? I believed in Jesus, so now I'm no longer going to hell, so now I can do whatever I want. But no, God has called us that we might serve him. Right? Think about the covenants we've mentioned, the covenant God made with Israel, the one that he made with David, the one that he made with Abraham. God had a task specifically for each and every one of them to do. Israel's task was to represent God to the nations, to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. David's task was to lead the people, to guard them, uh, to, to lead them in worshiping the one true God. Abraham's task was to believe, to trust that God would truly bring through offspring through his wife, Sarah, who had been barren into old age. He was to trust that God would protect him in the midst of all these things. Indeed, the call of the life of faith for all of us is to believe and trust that God to believe and trust in God and to be a part of his people. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says that God has prepared good works for us in order that we should walk in them. Right? And so we should, and as we desire to follow the Lord, as we desire to follow Jesus Christ, we should seek to remove sin from our lives. How am, are there ways in which I am not perfectly holy, that I can continue to be sanctified before the presence of the Lord by his Spirit? that I can root out my heart. We ask God to search and know my heart, O oh God, and see if there's any grievous way within me. And as we reflect upon them, we also have to think about what God has called us to. Uh, there might be certain relationships, certain ministries that the Lord is calling you to, and maybe you are afraid to step out in faith and to trust that God has a purpose for you in that ministry. I would say believe, trust, and obey the Lord. None of us know what God could accomplish through us if only we would believe. Well, the good news is, as we think about our own holiness and righteousness, or perhaps even our lack thereof, we know that Jesus came to make us holy, that God gives us life by his Holy Spirit and sanctifies us that we should walk in him. And so again, as Zechariah meditates on the redemption, as he meditates upon his sanctification, he finally meditates upon God's preparation. God's preparation. Remember, God is about to do something new that's going to make the promises that he made to Abraham, Moses, David look like, you know, look like nothing. And it's not because those promises are insignificant, but rather what he's going to do in Jesus Christ will be so great. And it not only makes those look small, but it, it fulfills them. It fulfills the promises that he made to the fathers. So Zechariah t turns his attention to his newborn son and he addresses John in verse 76. You can imagine him holding this tiny infant and singing him this jubilant and holy song in verse 76. And you, child, you will be called the prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord to prepare his way. All right, we already know that John is filled with the Holy Spirit even in his mother's womb. And John's task is not to fix all the problems in the world, but rather to prepare the way for the Lord. As Don read a moment ago from Mark chapter 1, verses, uh, verse 3, there's a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So John is preparing the world for Jesus to come. Oh, how will he do this? Verse 77, he will give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of of our God. John's going to prepare the people so that when Jesus shows up, they're ready to receive him. I remember whenever I was growing up in First Baptist Church of Powell, Tennessee, I grew up under the ministry of Phil Jones, who retired last year after more than 30 years at that church. So my entire life, he'd been the pastor that I knew. So I remember one time I was on a mission trip and I asked an older member who'd been at the church her entire life, I said, who were the pastors like before Phil? Because that's the only, you know, I only know about Pastor Phil. I don't know of any other pastoral ministry, pastors who ministered there. And she told me about a few of them, but she said, she ch kind of chuckled whenever she mentioned the interim pastor who'd come before Phil. And she said, man, we were not ready for him. He was really strict. Uh, one time he said something in a sermon and people laughed and he excoriated the congregation for laughing because you do not laugh in the house of God. At least that's what he said. And so she said, while that was intense on the congregation, it forced them to adjust in some ways. She said it really prepared the congregation, though, to receive the ministry that Phil would bring. Uh, 
All right, it prepared the people to hear God's word and to take it very seriously. So that whenever a pastor came, and, and one of the great things about Pastor Phil is that he preached the word of God faithfully week in and week out for decades at First Baptist Powell. They were ready to receive that word. Similarly, John would go about preaching repentance to the people, getting the people to prepare for this message of forgiveness of their sins, that they might receive mercy. And the longest account we have of this in the Gospels is in Luke chapter 3. There, we're told that Luke is preaching and different groups come to him and they're like, well, what should we do? How can we repent? And he gives them instructions. He looks to the tax collectors and he says, you don't take any more money than the government says you should be taking. Don't take any extra for you on the side. To the soldiers, and the soldiers would have been like modern day police in our society today. Well, how can we repent? How can we follow the Lord? And John's advice to the police, not advice, his command to them, to the soldiers, is don't steal, don't extort from those, and don't make threats. All right? That's one of the ways in which they can serve God and prepare for Christ. And what about the religious people? Brothers and sisters, we have to be careful because the religious ones, people, are the ones who had the hardest time when Jesus came. They had the hardest time getting them ready for his coming because they had to repent of perhaps the most difficult sin to rid ourselves from all. They had to repent of self-righteousness. They go around thinking that it's their way or the highway, that just as they're doing it in their lifetime and the years that they live is exactly how God wanted everyone to do it from all time. And they weren't open to what God had to say. And so John, as he's preaching to them, he gets them ready to hear the gospel that Jesus himself would bring He's preparing them to meet Jesus. And I want to ask you, have you ever thought of your ministry as a ministry of preparation to help people meet Jesus? Right? I think that oftentimes we think of the work that God has called us to in the Great Commission, that we should proclaim the gospel to all nations, is that we need to take everyone from, let's say, a zero is they don't know the Lord, and ten is they have believed and are trusting him by faith. And we think that in every single relationship, we need to take someone from zero to ten. And that they'll, they'll know God as a result of knowing us. Now, we should, be fervently to, we should fervently work to proclaim the gospel, but know that God might work on you to take someone from a one, their heart is just totally hardened to the gospel, and maybe you're just moving them from a one to a five. Or maybe they are somewhat warmed to the gospel, but they don't believe. Maybe God's role for you is to help them get from a four to a seven. Right? The Holy Spirit can do whatever he wants. So if you go from zero to ten, praise God. From four to ten, seven to ten, our goal is that all men and women would believe and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. We have to ask, though, how hardened is someone's heart? What type of relationship do you have with them? What gifts and aptitudes has the Lord equipped you with to help you prepare the way for the Lord, for the reception of the gospel, for this message of mercy and forgiveness that Jesus Christ brings? Well, as we prepare them, we prepare them for Jesus because, like John, we cannot save them. For salvation is in the name of Jesus Christ alone. Right? When they hear the gospel, we know that the sun of righteousness shall rise upon them. Look at verse 78 and 79. It says, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who are in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. The message of salvation that John delivers is a Jesus-centered salvation. Right? John isn't the Savior, neither are we. I'm reminded of what John, the, the Gospel of John says about John the Baptist in John uh, 1, verses 6 to 8. John says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. But listen to this. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. Brothers and sisters, as we go out into the world our job is not to receive glory from men, but rather is to proclaim what God has done in Christ, is to help men and women around the world know that God who had made the world and who we rebelled against, the God who called Abraham and Moses and David and others, the God who spoke through the prophets, has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ, his son. And that we, wherever we might be, if we repent of our sins, if we repent of our wickedness and trust this Jesus that we can have salvation, right? Because Jesus, as he comes and he brings mercy and forgiveness to the world, he does it through the cross. He died upon the cross that you and I might be forgiven, that, 
the Lord would receive him as a sacrifice for us. And not only did he die, but he rose up from the dead three days later. This is the message that saves. And so like John, may we be forerunners to prepare people for the salvation that is coming in Christ. Really the salvation that has come. But the ministry of Jesus continues to reach people in the world today. And so as we think about even this week of Advent, the week of love, may we love our neighbors fervently by proclaiming the gospel to them. May we say with the song, Joy to the World, let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Let us proclaim the Lord's redemption and let us proclaim his salvation. If you would, please pray with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your servant Zechariah, who, although he had a lapse of faith, nevertheless continued to serve you and to proclaim the good news that you had saved him and his people and that you were doing something new in the world. God, we thank you that we have servants like John who come to prepare our hearts. Someone who would say, he must increase and I must decrease. So God, would you help us to be faithful servants? God, for those who don't yet believe, I pray that they would hear this message. And God, knowing that as we look in the world today, there are so many difficult things that are happening And even sometimes we look at other Christians, other churches, and we're aghast at some of the behavior. But nevertheless, Jesus is pure. Jesus is right. Jesus is holy. So God, would you help us to be pure and righteous and holy that we might be his ambassadors in the world and proclaim the good news. God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen.